Chapter 91 Meng Shuo, the head of the Man Chieftains, and notables attended to do honor to the army of Shu on its departure. They reached the River Lu in autumn, the ninth month. But on trying to cross the river, a tremendous storm came and hindered them. Wai Yan having reported his difficulty to Zhu Jian, Meng Hu was asked if he knew of any reason for such a storm. Meng Hu replied, wild spirits have always troubled those who would cross this river. It is necessary to propitiate them with sacrifices. What is the sacrifice? asked Zhu Jian. In the old days when malicious spirits brought misfortune, they sacrificed humans to the number of seven sevens and offered their forty-nine heads. They also slew a black ox and a white goat. Sacrifice thus, the wind will subside and the waters come to rest. The same used to be done to secure a plenteous harvest. How can I slay a single person now that fighting is done and peace has returned? said Zhu Jiang. Zhu Jiang went down to the river to see for himself. The north wind was blowing hard and the waves were high. Both humans and horses seemed frightened. He himself was perplexed. Then he sought out some of the natives and questioned them. They said, We have heard the demons moaning every night since your army crossed the river. The cries begin at dusk and continue till dawn. There are many dark demons in the malarial vapors, and no one dared cross. The sin is mine, sighed Zhu Jiang, for more than a thousand soldiers of Mardai perished in these waters beside many southern people. Their poor distressed souls are not yet freed. Therefore I will come this night and sacrifice to them. According to the ancient rule the number of victims ought to be forty-nine. Then the spirits will disperse, said the natives. As the resentful demons are here because of the deaths of people, where is the sense in slaying more humans? But I know what to do. Zhu Jiang bade them make balls of flour paste after the manner of human heads and stuff them with the fresh of oxen and goats. These would be used instead of human heads and they call these mantu or human heads. By nightfall, an altar had been set up on the bank of the river with the sacrificial objects all arranged. There were also forty-nine lamps. Flags were flying to summon the souls. The forty-nine mantas were piled up on the ground. In the middle of the third watch at midnight, Zhu Jian dressed in Taoist garb went to offer the sacrifice in person and he bade Dong Zhu read this prayer. On the first day of the ninth month of the third year of the era beginning prosperity of the Han dynasty, I, Zhu Jiang, Prime Minister of Han, Lord of Wuxing, Imperial Protector of Yishu, reverently ordered this sacrifice to appease the shades of those soldiers of Shu who have died in their country's service and those of the southern people who have perished. I now declare to you, O ye shades, the majesty of my master, the Emperor of the mighty Han dynasty excelling that of the five feudatories and brilliantly continuing the glory of the three dynastic kings. Recently, when the distant south rebelliously invaded his territory, contumeliously sent an army, loosed the venom of their sorcery, and gave free reign to their savagery and rebellion, I was commanded to punish their crimes. Wherefore my brave armies marched and utterly destroyed the contemptible rebels. My brave soldiers gathered like the clouds, and the insensate rebels melted away. Hearing of the easy successes I won, they were entirely demoralized. My army consists of heroes from the nine regions, and officers and people are famous in the empire, or are expert in war, and skilled in the use of arms. They go where the light leads them, and serve the emperor. All have exerted themselves to obey orders and carried out the plans for the seven captures of Meng Huo. They were wholehearted in their service and vied in loyalty. Who could foresee that you, O spirits, would be sacrificed in the strategy and be involved in the enemy's wicked wiles? Some of you went down to the deep springs wounded by flying arrows. Others went out into the long night hurt by lethal weapons. Living you were valorous, that you left behind a name. Now we are returning home. The victor's song is in our mouths, and our prisoners accompany us. Your spirits are with us still, and certainly hear our prayers. Follow the banners, come with the host, return to your country, each to his own village, where you may enjoy the savour of the meat offerings, and receive the sacrifices of your own families. Do not become wandering ghosts in unfamiliar hamlets of restless shades and strange cities. I will memorialize our emperor that your wives and little ones may enjoy his gracious bounty every year gifts of food, 
and clothing every month, donations or sustenance. Comfort yourselves with this provision. As for you spirits of this place, shades of the departed people of the south, here is the usual sacrifice. You are near home. Your own sacrifice is not lacking. Living you stood in awe of the celestial majesty, dead you come within the sphere of refining influence. It is right that you should hold your peace and refrain from uttering unseemly cries. With bowed head I pray you partake of the sweet savour of this sacrifice. Alas, ye dead, to you this offering. Zhu Liang broke into loud lamentations at the end of this prayer and manifested extreme emotion, and the whole army shed tears. Meng Huo and his followers also moaned and wept, and amid the sad clouds and angry mist they saw the vague forms of many demons floating away on the wind till they disappeared. The material portion of the sacrifice was then thrown into the river. Next day the army stood on the south bank with a clear sky over their heads and calm waters at their feet, the clouds gone and the winds hushed, and the crossing was made without misadventure. They continued their way, whips cracking, gongs clanging, spurs jingling, and ever, and anon the song of victory rising over all. Passing through Yongxing, Wang Kang, and Liu Kai were left there in command of the four territories issue, Yongxing, Zhang, and Yusui, and then Meng Huo was permitted to leave. He was ordered to be diligent in his administration, maintain good control, and soothe and care for the people left to him to govern, and to see to it that agriculture was promoted. He took leave with tears rolling down his cheeks. When the army neared capital Chengdu, the latter ruler came out ten miles and stayed to welcome his victorious minister. The emperor stood by the roadside as Zhu Jian came up and waited. Zhu Jian quickly descended from his chariot prostrated himself, and said, Thy servant has offended in causing his master anxiety. But the conquest of the south was long. The emperor took Xu Jian kindly by the hand and raised him. Then the chariots of the Son of God and his minister returned, to Chengdu side by side. In the capital were great rejoicings with banquets and rewards for the army. Hence a were distant nations sent tribute, to the imperial court of the number of two hundred, as proposed in a memorial, the emperor provided for the families of the soldiers who had lost their lives in the expedition, and they were made happy, and the whole land enjoyed tranquility. Meanwhile in the Middle Land, the ruler of Wai Kaupai had now ruled seven years, and it was the fourth year of beginning prosperity in Shuhan calendar. Kao Pai had taken to wife a lady of the Zhen family, formerly the wife of the second son of Yuan Shao. He had discovered Lady Zhen at the sack of Ye Jun, and had married her. She bore him a son, Kao Rui, who was very clever and a great favorite with his father. Later Kao Pai took as beloved consort a daughter of Gyu Yang in Guangzhou. Lady Gyu was a woman of exceeding beauty, whom her father said, she is the king among women and the name Lady King stuck to her. But with Lady Gyu's arrival at court, Lady Zhen fell from her lord's favor, and the beloved consort's ambition led her to intrigue to replace the empress. She took Shang Tao, a minister at the court, into her confidence. At that time the emperor was indisposed, and Zhang Tao alleged, saying, In the palace of the empress has been dug up a wooden image with your majesty's date of birth written thereon. It is meant to exercise a maleficent influence. Kao Pai in his anger forced his empress to commit suicide, and he set up the beloved consort in her place, but Lady Gyuo had no issue. Wherefore she nourished Kao Rui as her own. However loved as Kao Rui was, he was not then named heir by the empress. When he was about fifteen, Kao Rui, who was an expert archer and a daring rider, accompanied his father to the hunt. In a gully they started a doe and its fawn. Kao Pai shot the doe while the fawn fled. Seeing that the fawn's course led past his son's horse, Kao Pai called out to him to shoot it. Instead the youth burst into tears. Your majesty has slain the mother. How can one kill the child as well? The words struck the emperor with remorse. He threw aside his bow saying, My son, you would make a benevolent and virtuous ruler. From this circumstance Kao Pai decided that Kao Rui should succeed and conferred upon him the princedom of Pinyuan. In the fifth month the emperor fell ill, and medical treatment was of no avail. So the chief officers were summoned to the bedside of the emperor. They were commander of the center army Kao Zhen general, who guards the west Chenquan, and grand commander Simei. 
When they had come, the emperor's son was called, and the dying emperor spoke thus, I am grievously ill, and my end is near. I confide to your care and guidance this son of mine. You must support him out of good feeling for me. Why does your majesty talk thus? said they. We will do our utmost to serve you for a thousand autumns and a million years. No, I know that I am about to die, said the emperor. The sudden fall of the gates of Zuchin this year was the omen, as I well knew. Just then the attendants said the general who conquers the East Kao Zhu had come to ask after the emperor's health. They were told to call Kao Zhu into the chamber. When he had entered, Kao Pai said to him, You and these three of the pillars and cornerstones of the state, if you will only uphold my son, I can close my eyes in peace. These were his last words. A flood of tears gushed forth and Kao Pai sank back on the couch dead. He was forty years of age and had reigned seven years A.D. 229. The four ministers raised the wailing for the dead, and forthwith busied themselves with setting up Kao Ruri as the emperor of Great Wai. The late emperor received the posthumous style of Emperor Pai. The late empress, the consort who had suffered death, was styled Empress Yen. Honors were distributed freely in celebration of the new reign. Zhang Yao was made imperial guardian. Kao Zhen Regent Marshal Kao Zhu, Minister of War, he was in Grand Commander Wang Lang, Minister of the Interior, Chen Kun, Minister of Works, Sima Yi, Imperial Commander of the Flying Cavalry, and many others conspicuous and obscure were promoted. A general amnesty was declared throughout all the land. About this time a vacancy existed in the commandership of Yang Zhu and Lian Zhu. Sima Yi asked the post and got it. He left for his new office as soon as he had received the appointment. All military affairs of the West were now under his command. In due time the news of all these doings reached Chu Jiang and perturbed him not a little. He was anxious, saying Kao Pai is dead and his son Kao Rui has succeeded him, but that is not my concern. Only I am worried about Sima Yi, who is very crafty and skillful in the art of war and who in command all western forces of Yangzhu and Lianzhu may prove a serious danger to Shu. This Sima Yi ought to be attacked at once. Councillor Masu spoke of this matter. You old Prime Minister have just returned from an arduous and exhausting expedition, and you should take time to recuperate before you undertake such another. However, I have a scheme by which Kao Ru may be brought to work the destruction of Sima Yi. May I lay it before you? What plan have you? said he. The young emperor has no confidence in Sima Yi, although Sima Yi is a high minister of state. Now send someone secretly to Luoying and Yejun to disseminate reports that Sima Yi is about to rebel. Further prepare a proclamation in his name, and post it up so as to cause Kao Ru to mistrust him, and put him to death. Zhu Jiang adopted the suggestion. Whence it came about that many notices suddenly appeared, and one found its way to the city gate of Yejun. The wardens of the gate took it down and sent it to Kao Rui. This is what it said. I see Mayi, Imperial Commander of the Flying Cavalry, Commander of the Forces of Yangzhu and Lianzhu, confident in the universal principles of right, now inform the Empire, saying, The founder of this dynasty, Emperor Kao, established himself with the design of recurring the Empire to the Lord of Linzi Kaoshai. Unfortunately, calumny spread abroad, and the dragon ruler could not manifest himself for many years. Emperor Kao's grandson Kao Rui does not follow a virtuous course, though sitting in the high place, and has not fulfilled the great intention of his ancestor. Now I, in accordance with the will of heaven, and favoring the desires of the people, have decided upon a day to set my army in motion in order to secure the wish of the people. When that day arrives, I call upon each one to gather to his lord, and I will destroy utterly the family of any who shall disobey. You are hereby informed that you may all know. This document frightened the young emperor, and he turned pale. At once he called a council of his officials to consider it. Huazin said that was the reason for his having requested the commandership of Yangzhu and Lianzhu. Now Emperor Kao, the founder of Great Wai, frequently said to me that Sima Yi was ambitious and hungry, and should not be entrusted with military authority lest he harm the state. This is the first beginning of rebellion 
and the author should be put to death. Wang Lang said Simu Yi is a master of strategy and skilled in tactics. Moreover, he is ambitious and will cause mischief if he be allowed to live. Wherefore Kao Ru wrote a command to raise an army, which he would lead to punish the minister. Suddenly Kao Zhen stood forth from the rank of military officers and said, What you advise is impossible. His late majesty Emperor Pai confided his son to the care of certain officers of state, of whom Sima Yi is one, wherefore it is certain that he felt sure of Sima Yi's probity. So far nothing is known certainly. If you hastily send an army to repress him, you may force him into rebellion. This may be but one of the base tricks of Shu or Wu to cause dissension in our midst, so that occasion be found to further their own aims. As no one knows, I pray your majesty reflect before you do anything. Supposing Sima Yi really contemplates a revolt, what then? said Kao Rui. Kao Zhen replied, If your majesty suspects him, then do as did Liu Bang the supreme ancestor of Han Wen under pretense of taking a trip on the Lake Yumeng. He summoned his vassals and seized Han Xin, who had been denounced. Go to any Sima Yi will assuredly come out to meet you, and his actions and demeanor may be watched closely. He can be arrested if needed. Kao Rui changed his mind. Leaving Kao Zhen to regulate the affairs of state, the young emperor went out with the imperial guards to the number of one hundred thousand and traveled to any. Ignorant of the reason of the emperor's coming and anxious to show off his dignity, Sima Yi went to welcome his ruler in all the pomp of a commander of a great army of one hundred thousand. As Sima Yi approached, the courtiers told the emperor, saying Sima Yi's defection is certain since such a large army can only mean that he is prepared to resist. Whereupon Kao Zhu, with a large force, was sent in front to meet him. Sima Yi thought the imperial chariot was coming, and he advanced alone, and stood humbly by the roadside till Kao Zhu came up. Kao Zhu advanced and said, Friend, his late majesty entrusted you with the heavy responsibility of caring for his son. Why are you in revolt? Sima Yi turned pale, and a cold sweat broke out all over him, as he asked the reason for such a charge. Kazu told him what had occurred. This is a vile plot on the part of our rival Shu and Wu to cause dissension, said Sima Yi. It is a design to make the emperor work evil upon his ministers, that thereby another may profit. I must see the son of heaven and explain. Ordering his army to retire, Sima Yi went forward alone to the emperor's chariot. Sima Yi bowed low and said weeping, his late majesty gave me charge of his son. Could I betray him? This is a while of the enemy. I crave permission to lead an army first to destroy Shu, and then to attack Wu, whereby to show my gratitude to the late emperor and your majesty, and manifest my own true heart. However, Kao Rui did not feel quite convinced, and Hu Zin said, in any case withdraw his military powers, and let him go into retirement. And thus it was decided. Sima Yi was forced to retire to his native village. Kazu succeeded to his command, and Kao Ru returned to Luoying. The news was soon reported to Xu. Zhu Zhang rejoiced when they told him of the success that had attended the ruse. Sima Yi and the forces he commanded in Yangzhu and Lianzhu have been the obstacles in my long wish for attack on Wai. Now he has fallen, I have no more anxiety. At the first great assembly of officers at court, Zhu Zhang stepped forth and presented to the ruler of Xu a memorial on the expedition he contemplated. The first ruler had accomplished but half his great task at his death. At this moment the empire is in three parts, and our country is weak, it is a most critical moment for us. Still ministers are not remiss in the capital, and loyal and devoted soldiers sacrifice their lives abroad, for they still remember the special kindness of the first ruler, and wish to show their gratitude to him by service to your majesty. Therefore, it would be indeed fitting that you should extend your holy virtue to glorify his virtuous memory in the stimulation of the will of your purposeful officers. Your majesty should not lose yourself in the pursuit of mean things, quoting phrases to confound the eternal principles of rectitude, and so preventing remonstrance from honest people. One rule applies to the palace of the emperor and the residence of a courtier. There must be one law rewarding the good and punishing the evil. Evil doers, and lawbreakers, as also true and good people, should be dealt with according to their deserts, 
by the officers concerned in order to manifest your majesty's impartial and enlightened administration. Partiality is wrong, as is one law for the court and another for the regions. The high ministers Fei Yi Ju Yuzhai and Dong Yun are honest men devotedly anxious to be loyal to the last degree. Wherefore, his late majesty chose them in his testament. My advice is to consult them in all palace matters, great or small, before taking action. Your majesty will reap the enormous advantage of having any failings corrected. General Zheng Chang is a man of well-balanced temperament, versed in military matters to whom, after testing him, the late emperor applied the epithet capable. The consensus of opinion is that Zheng Chang should be grand commander. My advice is to consult him in all military matters, great or small, whereby your military forces will yield their maximum, each one being employed to the best advantage. Attract worthy people. Repel mean ones. This policy achieved the glory of the former hands, while its reversal ruined the latter hands. When the late emperor was with us, he often discussed this with your servant, and he took much to heart the story of emperors Huan and Ling. The chair of the secretary at Chen Zhen, Commander Zhang Xi, and Minister Jiang Wan are all incorruptible and enlightened people honest to the death. I wish that your majesty should have them near and hold them in confidence. If this be done, then the glory of the House of Han will be quickly consummated. I was originally a private person, a farmer in Nanyang, concerned only to secure personal safety in a troubled age, and not seeking conversation with the contending nobles. His late majesty, the first ruler overlooking the commonness of my origin, condescended to seek me thrice in my humble court and consult me on the trend of events. His magnanimity affected me deeply, and I consented to do my utmost for him. Then came defeat and I took office at a moment of darkest outlook and at a most difficult crisis. This is twenty-one years ago. The first ruler recognized my diligent care, and when dying he confided the great task to me. From that day I have lived a life of anxiety lest I should fail in my trust and so dim his glory. That is why I undertook the expedition to the lands beyond the river Lu. Now the southern mangs has been quelled, and our army is in good condition. I ought to lead it against the north, where I may meet with a measure of success in the removal of the wicked ones, the restoration of Han, and a return to the old capital. This is my duty out of gratitude to the late emperor, and loyalty to your majesty. As to a discussion of the pros and cons, and giving a true version of the whole matter, that belongs to Gyu Yuzhai and Fei Yi and Dan Yun, I desire your majesty to confide to me the task of slaying the rebels and restoring the Huns. If I fail, then punish me by telling the spirit of the late emperor. If you know not what restoration implies, that is the fault of your advisers. Your Majesty should take pains to be guided into the right path and examine carefully what is laid before you, carefully remembering the late Emperor's testament. I cannot express what would be my delight if you had the goodness to accept and act on my advice. Now I am about to depart on a distant expedition. I write this with tears and in deep emotions beyond my words. The Emperor read it through and said, My father minister, you have only just returned from a distant and fatiguing expedition against the southern lands. You are not yet refreshed, and I fear this march to the north will be almost too much even for you. Zhu Jiang replied, The heaviest responsibility lies upon me, the well-being of your majesty confided to me by the first ruler. My efforts may not be relaxed night or day. The south is at rest at home is no anxiety. What better time could be hoped for to destroy the rebels and recover the middle land? Forth from the ranks of courtiers stood Minister Kai Zhu and said, I have studied the aspect of the stars. The northern quarter is brilliant and strong. The scheme will not speed. Then turning toward the Prime Minister, he continued, You, O Prime Minister, understand the mysteries of the skies. Why do you oppose the stars? Because the stars are in infinite changes, replied Zhu Liang. One may rely on the stars too much. Moreover, I have already sent the army into Hanzhong, where I shall act as soon as I have studied what is afoot. Kai Zhu pleaded in vain. Zhu Jiang was too strongly set upon his purpose to yield. So Zhu Yuzhai Dong Yan and Fei Yi were ordered to attend to matters in the palace. 
Zheng Chang was to control all military affairs and became Grand Commander. Zhang Lan was made military advisor. Chen Zhen became chair of the Secretariat. Zhang Si, controller of the Prime Minister's Palace. Du Qiang, Imperial Censor. Du Wei and Yang Hong, Ministers. Men Guang and Lai Min, Libationers. In Mo and Lai Zhu and Academicians. Zai Zheng and Fei Shi, General Secretaries. Kaio Zhu, Chief Secretary. And others to the number of over a hundred all to manage the administration of Shu in the absence of Zhu Jiang. Having received his emperor's command to lead an expedition against the north, Zhu Jiang returned to his palace and summoned the officers of the army to listen to the orders. And they came, and to each was appointed a duty in the great army. Front Army Commander Wai Yan. Front Army Marching General Zhang Yi Wang Ping. Rear Army Commander Lai Hui. Rear Army Marching General Lu Yin. Left Army Commander and Chief of the Commissariat Ma Dai. Left Army Marching General Zhang Nai. Right Army Commander Ma Zheng. Right Army Marching General Deng Chai. Center Army Director Liu Yong. Center Army Marching Generals Liao Hua, Hu Jai. Center Army Front General Zhu and Lin Liu Ba. Zhu Yang. Center Army Rear General Hu Ban. Center Army Left Generals Wu Yiding Zion. Center Army Right Generals Gao Zhen, Wan Yong, Lu Minit. Center Army Center Generals Yu Kai, Sheng Bo, Fan Kai. Advisors Ma Su Yang Yi, Qiu and Zai Du Yi. Secretary Fan Jai and Dong Chu. Left Guard Guan Xing, Right Guard Zhang Bao. Inspector Yan Yan. Nai Yan was given the task of guarding the passes against Wu from the southeast. Zhu Jiang was the Commander in Chief of the Northern Expedition. All being ready, a day was chosen for the start, the fifth year, the third month, on the day of Tiger. After the appointments had all been made, there came forward a veteran, who had listened in vain for the duty assigned him. Old I may be, said he, yet have I still the valor of Lion Powell and the heroism of Ma Yuan. Why am I thought useless any more than these two who refuse to acknowledge old age? It was Zhao Zilong. Zhu Jiang said, I have lost my friend Marqueo by illness since I returned from the southern expedition, and I feel as I had lost an arm. Now, General, you must own that the years are mounting up. Any slight lapse would not only shake the lifelong reputation of yourself, but might have a bad effect on the whole army. Zhao Zilong replied bitterly, I have never quailed in the presence of the enemy from the day I first joined the first ruler. I have ever pressed to the front. It is a happy ending for a person of valor to die on the frontier. Think you that I should resent it? Let me lead the van, I pray. Zhu Jiang used all his skill to dissuade the veteran, but in vain. Zhao Zilong was set on it, saying, If you, O Prime Minister, do not let me lead the van, I will smash my head on the floor and die at your feet. At last Zhu Jiang yielded, saying, General, you can have the post of van leader, but you must choose a colleague to support you. I will go to help the veteran leader, cried Deng Zhai, without a moment's hesitation. I am not worth much, but I will help lead the attack on the enemy. Accordingly, five thousand of veterans were chosen for the advanced guard, and with them, to assist Zhao Zilong, went Deng Zhai and ten other generals. After the vanguard had set out, the main body marched by the north gate, the latter ruler himself going to see his minister start. The farewell was taken three miles from the gate in the face of the grand army with its banners and pennons flaunting in the wind, and spears and swords gleaming in the sun. Then they took the road leading to Hanzhong. Naturally, this movement was duly reported in Luoying at a court held by Kao Rui, when a minister said, A report from the border station says, the Zhu Jiang has marched 300,000 troops into Hanzhong. Zhao Zilong and Deng Zhai are leading the advanced guard. The report alarmed Kao Rui, and he asked, Who can lead an army to repel the advance? At once out spoke one saying, My father died in Hanzhong, and to my bitter resentment his death is unavenged. Now I desire to lead the army against you, and I pray that the armies west of the pass may be given me for this purpose. I shall render service to the state, as well as taking vengeance for my father. I care not what fate may befall me. The speaker was Zia Yun's son, Zia Mao. He was by nature very impulsive, and also very miserly. When young he had been adopted by Zia Dun. When Zia Yun was killed by Huang Shang, Cao Cao was moved and married Zia Mao to one of his daughters, Princess King, so that he was an imperial son-in-law.
As such, he enjoyed great deference at court, but although he held a military commission, he had never been with the army. However, as he requested the command, he was made commander-in-chief of the Western armies and was ready to march. But Minister of the Interior Wang Lang spoke against the appointment, saying the appointment is wrong. Xia Humao, the son-in-law, has never seen a battle and is unsuitable for this post, especially when his opponent is the clever and crafty Zhu Zhang, a man thoroughly versed in strategy. I suppose you have arranged with Zhu Zhang to be his ally, sneered Xia Humao. Ever since I was a boy, I have studied strategy, and I am well acquainted with army matters. Why do you despise my youth? Unless I capture this Xu Jian, I pledge myself never again to see the emperor's face. Wang Lang and his supporters were silenced. Zai Humao took leave of the ruler of Wai and hastened to Changden to get his army in order. He had 200,000 troops from the western areas. He would go to battle, take the signal flags in grip. But could he play the leader, he a lad with callow lip. The next chapter will deal with this campaign.